Hi guys and welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, I am Haley and I review classics, Christian fiction, nonfiction, and other books from a biblical worldview. And I warn you about any objectionable content that is found in books. I like to focus on books for kids, for teenagers, um, and things that you can feel comfortable giving your kid to read. So this is my April recap. It is finally the end of April and was it just me or did April feel like it went on forever? It felt like it was so long. But we finally reached the end and the fact that it was so long helped a lot in reading books. So I actually ended up reading in the month of April 3,868 pages and 14 books. So that feels like a lot. And I actually could have the pages off because there were so many books that I was losing track of how many pages are read. <laughs> but hopefully that's accurate and it feels like a lot. The video right now is extremely long so hopefully I can cut it down and give you guys good reviews of the books that I read because I read a lot of good ones, a lot of enjoyable ones, and um, I got pretty passionate about some of them. So I hope you guys enjoy this video and watch through it and find some good recommendations for books for you to read. I finished three books so far this month in April. Um, first, Not Part of the Plan by Kristen Clark and Bethany Beal. I gave this one four stars. I really enjoyed just the way that they dealt with um, talking biblically about when everything do things don't go as you want, how to trust God and what the Bible says about that. So they use a lot of scripture in here. It was actually helpful to me even at doing counseling and obviously helpful to me personally. There was a lot of good quotes in here and I really like the way that they um, use scripture and their, their personal stories were really encouraging to hear. One of them struggled with infertility and one of them was single for much longer than she expected to be. So I feel like I learned a lot from this and would definitely recommend it to you if you are struggling with just the idea of God's sovereignty and waiting on him. They talk about how worrying is a sin, how you should really be serving others during this time of waiting, how you can rejoice with others, understanding that my purpose on this earth isn't to fulfill my dreams for life. I really enjoyed just all the truths that were in this book. Another book that I finished already this month was A Match in the Making by Jin something off of the picture here. But I really enjoyed that book. It was really fun. I think I gave it maybe like 3.75 stars. I know, very specific. I just thought it was a fun fiction book. It wasn't Christian, but it felt like a lot of the other Christian fiction books. Basically, she's a matchmaker trying to find this guy a match um, after his wife died a few years ago and he has three kids. And so it's really fun. There's a lot of shenanigans going on. Um, his mother and mother-in-law live with him and help take care of the kids and they're really fun. The proposal scene at the end literally had me like laughing as I was listening to it in the car. I thought it was just like, if you want a light fluffy book, I thought it was a good one that was actually kind of encouraging. You know, it wasn't like you felt like it was a waste of time. And as far as cleanliness, I'm pretty sure like it was a definitely like a more of a clean love story which is pretty rare especially in Christian books I feel like they add a lot of love and romantic stuff and this one actually felt good and innocent and I think there was only like when she walks in it's kind of like love at first sight for him and so he he mentions a couple times how he's like attracted to her but there's nothing weird or detailed about it so I really appreciated that and then the last book that I finished already is Please Return to the Land of Luxury by John Tilton. I was sent this one for free and it is a middle grade kids just like kind of fantasy book a little bit. I'll post like a full review of it just because I was sent it for free and he's a, a smaller author um, so I want to you know give him support for that but I thought it was a good book with some good lessons of friendship and not being scared to like move on from your past and all that. It's a completely like innocent book to give your kids to read if um, your kids are interested in reading something like that. So those are the three books that I finished so far. Okay, I need to talk about three more books that I have finished. It is only the 10th of the month and I've finished six books so far. So I feel like this month is off to a pretty great start, even though some of them are a little bit shorter. So the first one was one that I listened to and that was The Four Loves by C.S. Lewis. So I listened to the only audiobook there is, which is um, C.S. Lewis going through his material from I think a class that he taught on The Four Loves. So I'm not sure if it's exactly identical to the um, actual book because there were a lot of quotes that like I know are in the the book that I didn't hear, I don't think, in the audio recording. But I'm still going to count it as reading it um, because 
it still covered all of the material. But anyways, so it's about the four different kinds of love. There's storge love, which is the love between like a parent and child. It's familial. It's that affection. Then there is uh, filial love, which is the love between friends, which he makes an argument that it's not just friendship and it's not just wanting to be around each other. Um, and that most people, that it's the only love that people can die never having experienced, which I thought was interesting. And then, uh, then there's Eros, which is the love between a man and a woman. And he talks about how it's so much more than just physical attraction, but it's truly loving one another. And then there's agape love, which in the audio thing, he pronounces it so weirdly. But um, that's like just fully sacrificial love that all the other three loves kind of lead up to that one. That is the purest form of love. And that's the love that God has for us. So I thought he brought out a lot of interesting insights in there. Is everything he says biblical and can it be found in the Bible? I don't think so. But I think he um, does just make some interesting observations on the different ways that we love people. And it's kind of encouraging. It makes you want to be better at showing that love and experiencing that love with other people. So I ended up giving that four stars and thought it was pretty good. Then I read uh, Charles Martin's When Crickets Cry. This is the story of a a small sleepy southern town and uh, a seven-year-old who has a lemonade stand and she's had a heart surgery and she needs to have a heart transplant plant eventually and then there's a stranger who comes up and and knows something about hearts and knows something about what she is going through um, I don't want to give away too much of the story and spoil it because it's a book that very very slowly gives you the the story um but i think it did it, it says a novel of the heart and it did a really great job of doing two things first you had the physical aspect of the heart and i feel like i learned so much about what the heart does how it functions um heart transplant surgeries and those surgeons and just how amazing they are it definitely made me appreciate what modern science can do and it made me appreciate what my own healthy heart does but then there was also the, I guess, emotional heart aspect of it, they, that there are people who are just so broken and they really, they can't get over things that have happened in their past and they're really struggling to have a, a normal heart, a, a healed heart. And so you kind of follow those two themes throughout the book and see people's broken hearts get fixed as well as their physical hearts get fixed. So I thought that was really neat. I wasn't really sure what to rate this book because in the beginning, I didn't really like it. I actually found it kind of slow in the beginning. There are parts that are really tense, but then Charles Martin likes to give a lot of details on like a lot of random things. So if the guy's working on a boat, then he kind of gives a lot of details on what kind of boat it is, something that I'm not interested in and I'm not going to even know what he's talking about. So I felt like there were some parts of it that were really slow. Also, so I tabbed this book, but if you can see like the first tab, there's a lot of pink tabs and that's the content warnings. And there was quite a few in that section of the book. And so that made me really not particularly like it. And that's up to like page 100. So I would say that after like 120 pages was when I really got into it and really liked it. It's really hard for me whenever authors write books where there's some secret that they're not revealing, but they're constantly alluding to it throughout the book. And so I was thinking of a, a, an illustration for that. And it's like if I gave, you were playing a, a word guessing game and I gave you blank O-O-K. So literally there could be so many letters that go in that first um, that first blank. It could be book, it could be look, it could be cook, it could be a lot of different words. And you kind of have like a guess, you have almost the whole story, but there's something missing and you can't for certain say what it is. So that's basically how Charles Martin writes all of his books, that there's just a key piece of the story missing and you have to keep reading to figure it out. And that can lead to a good story or it can be really annoying at times. But once things start getting revealed, um, it's really good. And the last like 100 pages, I think I read in like one night just because it was so riveting and you wanted to know what happened and it was very tense. Um, so I thought that was really interesting. I really liked the main character, um, Reese in here. He was just, he was a, a broken man but he was really sweet and you could see his care for all kinds of people, for his brother-in-law, for um, this little girl, for everyone that he was around. I thought that was really sweet. Um, 
So I did like it when I got to the end. I thought it was good. All the blue tabs are faith things. Um, and I thought there was a good emphasis on Christianity on here and on trusting in God. Um, however, this little section right here with all these pink tabs was not necessary. I think I would knock off a star just for that. So that's why I rated it four stars, just because all the content just takes off an entire star. But um, for those looking for content warnings, there's this bar that this guy has, and he uses it as a ministry to unbelievers, to people who are looking for answers in um, alcohol, in women. And so he kind of deceives them by advertising as this bad bar, but then when they come in, there's Bible verses everywhere. He actually serves like very watered down alcohol. So he has this idea for a ministry. But there's just a lot of things mentioned in there um, and it, it even talks about like it's questionable whether that was the best way to do it by putting up signs and misleading people. I guess there was a lot of like innuendo in there and allusions to what could go on at a bar. And then there's a whole section if you want to read the book starting on page 107 like you can skip basically to 110 of like adult magazines and and that's not the only mention, there's another mention somewhere. The The main character is talking about how they're bad and pointing this young man away from them and giving him a lot of truth that's even like biblical truth. But I think there's just too much discussion about it and it was pretty like an unnecessary scene. Later on you do see some character development from that character so that was cool. But I think you can skip over that part. Yeah, so overall I thought it was a good book, especially if you care about like health or learning about doctors and stuff. I thought that was really neat to learn that aspect of it and it was definitely well written and very riveting. It's just I wish that hit Charles Martin's book didn't have so much content especially since they are Christian and they have really good Christian themes but then there's a lot of content he throws in. Not saying that there shouldn't be like um, any kind of evil in the book because you can't have a book that's just light and fluffy and there's nothing bad in it but I think just the way he goes too in depth sometimes um, even from like a medical standpoint he can explain too many things um, so those are my thoughts on that book and then uh, the other book that I finished recently is The Lost World by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle so whenever I was probably around 10 to 12 I read all of the Sherlock Holmes um, stories multiple times. He was probably one of my favorite authors and I loved the way that he wrote and the stories that he wrote. Um, so we read this as a family. Uh, it was recommended uh, as one of the good family read alouds. I would say it was well written. It was interesting. I ended up giving it three stars. There was nothing wrong with it. I don't think it was just not really my type of book. I mean if you like dinosaurs and you like adventure books um, then I think you would probably enjoy this book. There is a lot of like evolution in there so just look out for that in a non-Christian point of view but other than that I don't think there was anything necessarily wrong with it except for it just didn't really capture my attention and there was only a few like really tense parts. I feel like towards the end maybe I got more into it but the beginning can be really slow to get into but overall it was enjoyable and it was fun to read. So those are the three books that I have finished recently and I will see you guys in the next clip. I want to talk about a couple of books that I just finished. So I finished two books recently. One of them was an audiobook and one of them is a print book. So the print book is The Reckoning at Gossamer Pond by Jamie Jo Wright. I have had this on my shelf for a little while and I've heard people talking about Jamie Jo Wright. This one is a romantic suspense book and I think she writes a lot of suspense kind of thriller type Christian books. And this one actually was with a book club with a uh, Maggie from Busy Moms Read. Um, she started a book club and she picked out this book so I was excited because I already had it on my shelf. So once I picked this book up I think I read it in 48 hours. I think. Um, there were so many nights where I just like could not put it down. I read for three hours straight outside one morning. I can't really talk much about the story without uh, spoiling it so I'm going to read what it says in the back. It says, for over a century the town of Gossamer Grove has thrived on its charm and midwestern values but Annalise Forsyth knows Painful secrets, including her own, hover just beneath the pleasant facade. Yet her strange and sudden inheritance of a rundown trailer home full of pictures, vintage obituaries, and old revival posters leaves her wholly unprepared for how truly dark and deadly those secrets may be. A century earlier, Gossamer Grove is stirred into chaos by the arrival of controversial and charismatic twin revivalists. The chaos takes a murderous turn when Le Libby Sheffield, while working at her father's newspaper, receives an obituary for a reputable church deacon hours before his death. As she works with the deacon's son to solve the crime, it becomes clear that a reckoning has come to town. 
but it isn't until another obituary arrives at the paper that they realize the true depths of the danger that they've walked, waded into. Two women, separated by a hundred years, must unravel the mysteries of their own town before it's too late and they lose their future or their very souls. So I ended up giving this, I think I gave it four stars. Um, like I said, I could not put it down. The writing was so good and I was just so into it and each chapter felt like it would reveal like just enough to where you wanted to keep reading and read the next chapter and figure out what was going on. So the writing I thought was really well done. Now the storyline, without really giving anything away, trying not to, um, the storyline was really focused, like the whole point of the book was that this family who's seen as the, um, the, the righteous, uh, like rich family of the town, like they're kind of the the patriarchs of the town and so they're seen as having like this perfect family but the whole premise of the book is basically figuring out um the, the whole family line is just has a lot of secrets and there's a lot of um adultery and um different things that have just been hidden and kind of shoved under the rug throughout this whole family so yeah there's definitely content warnings for there's a lot of discussion about um adultery and obviously it uh, the whole premise of the book is um, about sin and like repenting of your sin, which I thought was really cool because if you've seen any new videos on this channel, you know that that really bothers me whenever a Christian book talks about like uh, grace and the gospel and all that, but they're not talking about sin and repentance. And so then you're missing out on like the whole point of why we have the gospel is because of sin. So Jamie Doe Wright did a great job of talking about sin and the whole thing was about repentance. There's uh, one of the storylines, there's... Um, uh, adultery and then in the other storyline there is a like a teen pregnancy um and yeah there's just a lot of discussion of the the pregnancy and the the consequences of that and kind of just trying to pick up her life afterwards but I felt like it was dealt with in a really good way and it definitely gave me a lot of gratitude for how like the way that my life has been and how God has protected me and um, just to really be in the shoes of someone who has been through that, making really um, bad choices in their past and then having to live with that and figure out how to live their life um, afterwards. So I thought it was really well written. I really enjoyed it. If you've read the book, some of the characters were really well written. Like a lot of times I'll read books and I don't connect to the characters as much, even if um, a lot of other people say the characters are really well written and they relate to or like the descriptions are really good like the other book i'm about to review i didn't really agree with what everyone was saying on it but this one i really felt like i knew garrett he was really well written i really liked him and i think a lot of the male characters were actually just really good and you could connect with them and see like their personality i didn't feel that way so much with the female characters um but yeah garrett was really great and elijah was really complex like you want to like him but then I don't know and then Jacobus by the end you kind of can see something like good but definitely you know you would need to know his personality a lot more um but yeah so I, I liked the characters and um I was I was mad at them a couple times just for like not communicating and um so overall the storyline was really good although it is kind of sad and depressing and has to do with all of these um, sins, but I think there's a good, even though it's not explicit, I think there is themes of repentance and um, moving on and finding grace in those mistakes even that you've made. So um, if this is something that is interesting to you, this kind of romantic thriller, um, I would recommend it. Oh, one other thing that I don't really like about Jamie Dry, I've heard other people say it about some of her other books. Um, she does the whole Christian fiction thing of really like focusing on physical aspects of people. I don't think it was as bad as some of the other ones I've read where it's like a really tense moment and then they notice like his shoulders or something. Um, but I did... I mean, there were a few times where it was kind of uncomfortable and I don't know, it just seems kind of pointless for the storyline because there's just certain times where there's no need for there to be a physical description and yet for some reason that's talked about like the old lady stands up and pulls her, her um, shirt down over her flat hips and it's like why does that physical description even matter at this moment? So. Uh, that's just one thing I have to complain about. So obviously that does come out a little bit romantically, but really there's relationships in here and um, 
it's not like a squeaky clean clean book but i think it is dealt with pretty well throughout the book so i thought that was good and then the other one that i just finished which i could possibly rant about for a very long time but i read the frenchman's creek by daphne du maurier and I ended up giving this, well, I originally gave it three stars and then I dropped it just to two stars after I was reading all these reviews and really just thinking about it. Um, so basically the story is that Donna, saying something, is in this loveless marriage. She has two children and her husband is just kind of like the rich, naive guy. And she gets tired of him. So she goes off to the country to live with her two children in this mansion um, that she has because of her rich husband but she asked her husband to stay in um, town. And so then when she gets there, she hears that there's a pirate that's been going along the coast and been stealing from people and been possibly, allegedly talking to women and taking things from them. And of course, when she hears this story, she thinks, why not go try to find this pirate and have a great time with him? Um, and this, there's not really any spoilers because the whole back of the book will explain this too. But uh, she finds the pirate and uh, she does fall in love with him. Um, but don't forget, I did say that she was married. So the whole premise of the book is that uh, she basically lies to everyone around her to cover up these escapades that she's taking um, into the forest um, and on the pirate ship to spend time with this um, great pirate crew that is clearly so much more exciting than her normal life and obviously understands her so much better than her own husband. It's sarcasm by the way. Um, and the whole book is just so utterly ridiculous. I have seen some other reviews and even some of my friends who have read this book and said that they really enjoyed the book. They don't necessarily agree with the morals in it, but literally the entire point of the book is that is that she wants some other relationship outside of her marriage. And it's really sad because her husband actually is really sweet and he comes to her and like asks that she would communicate with him, that she would help him to understand her better. Um, there's a perfect opportunity for her to go back and to make this, this marriage right, but she doesn't even try. And it's such a good proof of the fact that love is a choice because I mean, who even is this pirate guy? Like he's not gonna last and be faithful and you don't even know who he is or how boring he's gonna be in six years, but she doesn't even care. It's just the fact that she doesn't want to love her husband anymore. Um, so yeah, it's a classic book or written by a classic author, um, but a lot of reviews were saying that it's probably based off of like her own life um, because the, the character Donna, she doesn't like the fact that she's a mother. She says that like the occupation of a mother basically is the most restricting and that you're just like a cog in the wheel that you can't get out of it and she hates being a mother and apparently Daphne du Maurier had those feelings. Um, so yeah, overall I would not recommend that book at all. Honestly, I don't even know why I gave it two stars. A lot of people say that her like writing is really good and her descriptions are really good. I think the writing, um, it flows really well. I don't particularly remember any of the descriptions, but I know a lot of people have said that she does descriptions really well. And um, yeah, so as far as cleanliness, the entire book is about um, her running away with this pirate guy. It was written in the 1940s, I believe, so there's nothing explicit in there, but there definitely are some situations that are very awkward and very tense, and so I definitely think she was um, alluding to things happening between them. Um, so I would not consider it a clean book. Oh, and the biggest thing that I didn't see in like any reviews is the language. So they said like, I mean, not horrible uh, language, but pretty much like every sentence someone was saying like damnation or saying hell and not in a good way. Um, and so literally every sentence, like even the sweet husband who just seemed like so innocent and like he couldn't ever be mad at anything, just his, his sentences were just littered with that. And it's like, why? And why is no one talking about this so yeah i did not appreciate that book at all and um definitely would not recommend it and i thought that the ending was that she ran away with the pirate um but i was reading another review that said something like she did go back with her husband so if you've read it did i miss something because i'm pretty sure that she ran away with the pirate in the end so there's the two books i've read recently okay i finished two books this week that were actually pretty good i feel like i'm on 
a roll for books. Um, and well, I finished one that was, I think I gave four stars, maybe, and then one I gave three stars. So the first one is Paris Betrayal by James R. Hannibal. I don't know if I've talked about it on this channel, but I love his books, uh, The Lost Property Office. I think it's called Section 13 is the, the series, and The Lost Property Office is the first one. Um, but I love those books, and I didn't really know that he wrote other books, but he kind of wrote books in a lot of different genres. So this one is kind of, it's a, he's a company spy, so he's kind of like a secret agent, undercover person that it's kind of like a subset of the government, but he's in Paris following this lead on uh, bomb materials, and everything kind of goes wrong. So then for literally the next like 300, I think it was like page 317 before something actually like went right, every time you think he's safe, someone finds him, and he's, so he's, it says on the back he's severed from his company so he no longer has any safe houses he no longer has any of the tools that he needs and he's trying to figure out what is going on why did everything go wrong why is his company not paying attention to him he meets a new friend that uh clara she's pretty cool and has a good like i think character arc by the end um and uh, he remembers like things from his schoolmaster throughout like quotes and and useful tips which I thought was interesting I don't know if I really liked it because it was kind of weird it would just go into like this paragraph of things that his schoolmaster had said before but I just really love James Hannibal's writing like not once throughout the book did I necessarily think about the writing like there wasn't anything slow there weren't any like typos in it I just really enjoyed it and it's based off of like a biblical story I don't want to share like which one because I don't want you to overthink it as you're reading it if you're overthinking like if it's an allegory then you'll view everything differently and you'll be like looking for that throughout so i thought he did it really well because it wasn't necessarily an allegory i don't like allegories because they're really like obvious it was just like inspired by this story in the bible and um and you you just get small little references throughout about it which i thought was really cool just the way he wrote it and i thought he did really well um it is really interesting because the whole plot line is about a bioweapon and he actually wrote most of the book before COVID-19 hit so it was like ready to be published almost and um, then COVID hit and so like a lot of the things that are happening here and the, the topics that are being discussed they could be applied to COVID so he had to figure out how to like edit this book to where this, this evil mastermind planning to send a bioweapon out into the world could fit with COVID already happening. So he does really well, I think, at adding little references to the the pandemic and, and wearing masks and being social distanced. There's like a couple of jokes about it. And I felt like he was being a little bit political and making good jokes like against um, wearing masks and, masks and stuff. I thought that was pretty funny, but um, I thought he did, he did a good job of it and made you like really fearful of that happening. Um, and you, there's definitely a lot of tensity. I love like the main character, Ben, he really, he just fights for what is right and he doesn't care about himself even though all these terrible things are happening and he's losing everything. He doesn't think about himself, he just wants to do the right thing and save the world even if no one else is listening. So I thought he was a really good character. If you like this type of secret agent, bioweapon, tense thriller type book i would definitely recommend this it is completely clean i think there was a couple of kisses um there's no language in it and obviously it does get pretty tense and there is a lot of violence in there but i didn't feel like it was graphic um it doesn't make you like feel it necessarily unless you're you're really empathetic towards the character ben you might really feel it but it wasn't like the descriptions were too descriptive if that makes sense so i really like this one and then the other one I read was one I listened to, Anomaly, by no idea who. This one was recommended to me from Lindsay from Books for Christian Girls. And I I enjoyed it, but I think there was two reasons why I didn't enjoy it as much as Lindsay did. First, I listened to it. It was a female narrator, and I was just talking to my mom about it's really hard to listen to books with a female narrator. I feel like they give their own impression, their own feeling to the story that kind of interprets it for you when you're listening to it, if that makes sense. And so this narrator just felt very childish and I don't think they were like children. I mean, they were definitely younger, 
but one of the main characters was a doctor so I think he was definitely older so that I think kind of just gave me a bad impression of the book just because of the way she read it and then the other thing I think that didn't make me like it as much is I think it's about 10 years old um, and since then a lot of books and movies have been made that are very similar to the storyline. Basically the storyline is there's been a big war and kind of destroyed the earth so you can probably think of about 10 different movies <laughs> based off that description um, and basically the earth is uninhabitable. You can't breathe the air, you can't drink the water. And so they have to basically go underground, which was already prepared for them. There was like bunkers down there. And they're basically growing children. Like the children aren't born naturally. Like love and family and all that is very foreign to them and very primitive. Um, and so there's like the 10 scientists that are in charge and they're raising these children to be very specific things. It's like genetically modified children. Like there's ones who are only musicians like they've messed with their brains where they're just really really good at being a musician and there's ones who are really good at being a doctor ones who are really good at math and one of them the main character is an anomaly um sally is her name and she feels emotions none of them are supposed to feel emotions so they start doing like tests on her and her friend burke um, is trying to save her from being annihilated and prove that she's very useful. Um, this was really interesting because I just finished The Turn of the Screw, which I haven't reviewed yet because it's part of a, a two-part book, but the whole point of The Turn of the Screw um, by Henry James is to show an unreliable narrator. You never know if the narrator is like making stuff up or if this is something that she's actually seeing. And I felt that a lot in Anomaly. It kept switching back and forth. You didn't know whether the scientists were good or whether they were bad and whether they were purposely trying to do something or um, whether they were trying to annihilate her. You, It kept switching throughout the story. And at the end, it turns out that they had these plans to do something and they forced the people to do a certain thing. Um, so that was a really interesting perspective to think about that throughout the, like as a reader, you had no idea what you're supposed to believe about the scientists because it kept switching. I thought there was some really good themes of faith and Christianity in here. There's one guy, John, who was sharing the truth about the Bible and about love. And then the song by Bach, the Yesu Joy of Man's Desire, I think, was talked about a lot. And so I don't think there was necessarily a gospel presentation, but there was a conversion. And I think it had really good themes in that. So all that to say that that reminded me of a lot of movies. Like if you take like Maze Runner, which I've read that book, mix it a little bit with um, like the, the tests that they do in Avatar, mix those together. A little bit of like Brave New World of, with the like brainwashing of the children and all of that. And yeah, take all of those like dystopian things and put them together. Oh, a little bit of Love and Monsters, that movie, because of like they're living in a bunker and they can't go up on the surface. So all those things like together, it reminded me of that story. So if you're looking for like a dystopian type story that is Christian, um, I think you would really enjoy that. I only ended up giving it three stars. Um, I would say that it's clean. There is like a romance in there, but I think it's really well done and really sweet. Like there's no kisses. It's just like the hugs and the friendship, which I thought was really neat. And there's no language in it. I guess some of like the medical tests and stuff can be a little bit disturbing, like the brain surgery stuff if you're sensitive to that. But I would say that it was mostly clean. So those are the two books that I have read recently. Another beautiful day outside and a another book finished. We have just been having such good weather outside recently in Texas. And I think that's contributed to me getting so much read. But I started this one probably last month. This is part of my 23 classics in 2023. This is two books in one, so I don't know if I should count it as one classic or as two classics. I have to decide that, I guess, by the end of the year. Okay, so it's two books by Henry James, which I'd never read Henry James before. Turn of the Screws first and then the Aspirin Papers. So the, 20, the Turn of the Screw is most of the book, and it was so weird. I think I'll probably give it two stars um the writing was like trying to be overly educated like these long sentences that made no sense like this it took of course more than that particular passage to place us together in presence of what we had now to live with as we could my dreadful liability to impressions of the order so vividly exemplified and my companion's knowledge henceforth a knowledge half consternation half compassion of that liability 
So the sentences are just like overly long. And then the premise of the turn of the screw is really weird. It's the classic ghost story for which Henry James is best remembered. Set in an English country house, it is a chilling tale of supernatural told by a master of the genre. So basically the, the reason why he wrote this and the reason why I think it's really famous is because of the unreliable narrator, which I mentioned in the last little clip I did. But um, the, the, you don't know whether the, the main character is knows what's going on, whether she's telling the truth, or whether she is under this false impression the whole time. And it kind of goes back and forth throughout the book. You believe that there are ghosts that she's seeing and that they're corrupting these children. But then you get to these points where it seems like she's crazy, she's out of her mind, and everyone else is just looking at her like, what is wrong with you? Um, so throughout the whole book, you don't really know whether she's crazy or whether everyone's just denying it. It was also really weird. It was written in like the late 1800s, early 1900s, I believe was when he wrote. And so the in books like that, you're not going to see any necessarily explicit content, but there can be just a lot of like innuendo and not really sure what kind of overtones he's trying to give to the book. And reading the preface or introduction, they talked a lot about how he was trying to make it just very like sexual undertones. Like maybe this is happening, maybe it's not. And it was just weird, creepy. I didn't understand why why anyone would enjoy it. Um, I guess I can see why it's influential, but I did not like it. So I was really scared to start the Aspirin Papers, the second one. Um, because I was like, great, I don't like Henry James, but I started this this book that has both of them in there, so I have to finish it to mark it as a book read. And honestly, after the first few chapters, when I just like sat down and read a bunch of it, I actually liked the aspirin papers. Those long sentences weren't there. It was much more readable. You connected a lot better to the characters, so you never know the, the main character, the narrator. It's told in first person. And he's trying to find these letters from Jeffrey Aspern, this um, poet. And he know, thinks that there's one lady living who s knew this poet back like a hundred years ago. And he believes that she has a bunch of letters from him that he would really benefit from if he could publish them. And so he goes to this lady's house and he knows that she won't ever part with the letters, but he tries to stay in her house, like renting out some rooms and um, trying to convince her to give him the letters. So it's really interesting. I'm not really sure what the point was of Henry James writing this particular book, but he definitely did a great job of portraying Venice, which is where they are. So he's an American and he's in, in Venice. And um, just the, the rivers, the canals that go through the city and the weather of the summer nights and how you would go out on the boat through the city. I thought that was really cool and those those imagery really uh, struck me. But the ending was so like disappointing because he totally could have had a happy ending and yet this the main character is so just self-serving and everything is for him. Like he he just wants the letters and that's it and he doesn't really care about the people who are connected to them which was kind of disappointing but I think overall the story was pretty good so I will give it three stars but yeah it was well told I enjoyed it I just wish there could have been a better ending I think you could definitely like rewrite an ending that is happy and has a great conclusion but I was really shocked by that second book being so much better than the first one which is the most common one that I guess people read in schools um, my favorite quote from it is, so the old lady is, um, you know, one of those bitter old ladies who speaks her mind. It actually reminded me a lot of in Anne of Green Gables. I believe it's the second or th second movie, I believe, second or third, when there's like the old lady and then her niece that helps her and she basically enslaves her niece and doesn't let her go out anywhere. That's kind of the, the vibes that you're getting in this Aspirin Papers. But anyways, something she said was, oh, I've seen enough. I've seen you enough for today. I'm satisfied. Now I'll go home. I just love it how like blunt it is and you could totally use that in real life, which I thought was really funny. So that is what I thought of those two books. All right, and two more books that I finished this month. So if you have reached this point in the video, you are probably so tired of hearing me talk about books. So if I talk for way too long about these last two, you can go ahead and slap me.
virtually. <laughs> Starting with the one before the last one, Bomb, The Race to Build and Steal the World's Most Dangerous Weapon by Steve Shinken. So this was the audiobook that I listened to and I absolutely loved it. And the sequel, which I'll be reviewing next month, so you have to wait a long time for that. But I ended up giving it five stars. And this is a non-fiction book that talks about the making the atomic bomb. It goes through the history of World War II and it really just lays out so realistically what it would have felt like to be living in that time especially for the scientists who were working on this bomb both the scientists in the u.s and also in russia um all the spies and all of that it really gave you a perfect picture of how dangerous the bomb was that these scientists they were taken out of their normal study their normal everyday life and they were sent to go work on this atomic bomb which was really exciting and they got to push the limits of, of physics and of chemistry and of everything they knew um, and it was so fascinating but then once they built the bomb they had this moral conflict of i just built something that can destroy millions of people and uh the part that stuck out to me the most was that after they set off the atomic bombs in Japan and the war had ended, but then the president wanted them to keep working on hydrogen bombs and just how hard that was for those scientists to continue to work on something and make something better and better that they were hoping they would never have to use. And it just really struck me of, okay, they could have been using their talents to make some other technology here, but sometimes we spend so much time making something better and better that doesn't need to be made better. And in this case, it was a world weapon that could have destroyed the entire world. So it was just really fascinating to see um, Oppenheimer and all the other scientists who were working on it and then to see all of these spies that were involved in it. There were so many spies for both sides, but particularly um, Soviet spies in America. And just to see all these things that we really thought were safe and were secret, um, none of it really was secret. So if you are into any kind of World War II or even um, science history, I would really recommend listening to this book. Uh, I'm sure reading it would be good too, but I think listening to it makes the nonfiction aspect a lot more interesting. Um, as far as content warnings, there was some language in here, but it was not over the top. It was not extremely bad language. And even though I don't like listening to it, it did fit the environment of this war scene. So if you are into that kind of history, please go pick this book up. And then the very last book I read this month, I finished it on the last day, was The Blue Castle by Ellen Montgomery. Now I have been recommended this book many times um, for a long time and I finally got my hands on a copy. My sister actually bought this copy for me. And um, I was really excited to read it and I heard it was very magical and romantic. So I was slightly disappointed. It wasn't as amazing as I thought it would be, but it was still a good story. Um, basically, we start out with the story of Valency Sterling. She's 29, she's unmarried, she's living with her mother and her cousin, I believe, and um, her entire family is just meddling. And they all are getting onto her and teasing her for not being married yet, and they won't leave her alone. And basically, she's been pushed around her entire life, does whatever her family wants her to do, and doesn't have her own life. So she gets shocking news from her doctor, and she decides, you know what? Who cares? I'm just going to rebel against everything I've ever done and against my family and I'm going to just see what the world is like when I'm not enslaved by the family. So this is where the conflict comes in. Was it a really interesting book? Yes. Um, was her family just totally annoying and did deserve what she did? Yes. Should she have done it though? Mm, it wasn't very respectful and there were parts that were very uncomfortable like you really wish that she would come back later and apologize for the things that she said even if they were true but she doesn't ever um, come back so I was a little disappointing. I felt like the storyline was a little bit predictable um, but in a good way. Like it wasn't terrible. It was just predictable in a, a, a romantic way. There are some really good quotes in here. She has one uncle who tells all these hilarious jokes and puns based off of her, her singleness, her old maidenness. I loved, and at the end of like chapter two, um, she says her brief bitterness had passed. She accepted facts as resignedly as she had always accepted them. She was one of the people whom life always passes by. There was no altering that fact. And then proceeds to go on for the next, at least a chapter, talking about all the ways that she is bitter, which I thought was 
quite hilarious. When the family's so ridiculous, there's so many good quotes like this one. Do you want to catch your death of cold again? Her voice implied that Valencia had died of a cold several times already. I definitely agree with this quote. People who don't like cats always seem to think that there's some peculiar virtue in not liking them. I mean, <clears throat> I feel that way. I don't like cats. Okay, and then we get to like the love story and I think it's hilarious because I have all of these purple tabs here and it escalated very quickly and I could definitely see where it was going. So it says he was thin, too thin. She wished she could feed him up a bit. She wished she could sew the buttons on his coat and make him cut his hair and shave every day. Okay, so she cares about him and wants to change him. Then it quickly goes to, it seemed easy to talk to blank. Um, then Valencia caught herself listening for his whistle every evening, rebuked herself, then let it go. Why shouldn't she listen for it? Then she found herself thinking of him in season and out of season. Next page. I like a man whose eyes say more than his lips, but then she liked everything about him. So in the space of like one, two, three, four pages, we are have already escalated that quickly. This was a good quote. If you can sit in silence with a person for half an hour and yet be entirely comfortable, you and that person can be friends. Oh, the most moving quote of the whole thing. I might cut this out because it might be spoilers, but. Of course, I'm not in love with you. Never thought I'd being in love, but you know, I've always thought you were a bit of a dear. And it's so, like, sad, but good. But then in the end, he says. So overall, in the end, it's a happy love story and it's really sweet. I agree with some other reviews that I saw that the language of the nature and all that isn't all that interesting and it can get kind of boring. And the author that they're always talking about in this book, John Foster, they give all these quotations from him and honestly, it didn't feel like that writing was all that good. Like he's the worshipped millionaire author. Um, but I was quite bored and unimpressed by his passages in there, which I thought was kind of funny. But if you're looking for just like a sweet romantic story, I think this is a good one. One that is like a friends to lovers. It is sweet and it is magical and enchanting. So I liked it. Okay, so that is a wrap on all the books I read in April. Hopefully you guys are not bored out of your mind and hopefully this video is not like three hours long. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. And if you would like to see more videos from me, please hit the subscribe button. See you guys next week. Bye.